When I was a little kid, and we were wa I was walking across the street with my parents, my parents would often look back and see, ooh, little Rainier is no longer here. Where is he? And they would find me a few meters back, if the sky was clear, staring up at the clouds. Or, not, well, clouds, hopefully not. Because I wanted to see the stars. I wanted to see the stars, see if I could recognize constellations, if I could distinguish that star is a slightly different color from that one. And so, at some age, my parents, we went on holidays to either the south of France or Germany, because the Netherlands is a particularly bad place to study stars. We have a lot of greenhouses which produce light, and just like here in the city lights, that means only the brightest stars will be visible to us. But if we go out, for example here, we could drive two hours, three hours and in the desert, we can already see a lot more. Who has seen the milky white band of the Milky Way stretch across the sky? Okay. For those of you who haven't, bully your parents in going to the desert at night. <laughs> now, I became an astronomer and I was lucky. As an undergraduate, I could go to telescopes. These telescopes are typically in places like the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, the top of the Canary Islands or high in the mountains of Chile. These places are so dark that if you put your hand in front of you, you don't see your hand. Until after 15 minutes, your eyes have adjusted and you have your hand back. <laughs> and when you look up at the sky, you don't see the Milky Way anymore. Well, you do, but it's so obscured by so many stars. You see only stars up there. More or less like the picture here. When I train my telescope, I go to my favorite object I want to study, and as I do so, I come across this. Or this. What, what is this? Has the universe decided that this place, there should not be any stars? No, this is actually a gas cloud, a cloud of gas and dust, which is obscuring all the visible light. The light we can see from penetrating the cloud, just absorbed here, and we see a black spot. Luckily, what we see with our eyes is only this, a very tiny bit of all the types of light that are out there. Ultraviolet light is the radiation which makes us go brown, and x-rays used in the airport security to look through our bags. But what we, as an astronomer, for these clouds want to do, we want to go to the infrared. You might have seen the thermal imaging camera out in one of the booths. It allows you to see hot things, or things, actually cold things, things which are colder, and because the wavelength, so the length of the waves of infrared is longer than the visible light we see, it actually allows to go around the dust in this cloud. And suddenly it reveals something much more interesting than all these stars around. These stars around, they do the same thing for 10 billion years, but here we see one, two young stars just formed. New stars creating new, new galaxies. New, new parts of our galaxy. And if we actually take this further, we go to the far infrared. This is an image from the Herschel Space Observatory. We see this. This is the size of the moon, so this is a fairly large chunk of the sky. We see all this noise, at least to you that might look like noise. To me, every one of these dots, every one of these, as the technical term is fuzzy blobs, is a galaxy a galaxy forming young stars at a rate of 100 to 1,000 new suns every year. However, these new stars are, like the two stars in our Milky Way, are in a big cloud of gas and dust. A gas cloud of dust as large as the galaxy itself. So the only way we can see that is in the far infrared. Now, I discovered as an undergraduate that half of the light of our universe is coming to us in the far infrared. Which means that if we were just able to look with our eyes with the visible, we see only half the information. We want the other half as well to learn everything there is to know. So I started studying how can I, as a graduate student, observe this? Well, I thought let's just take my camera from my phone. I have a nice CCD camera here in this phone, uh, same here as the digital camera here. And that's actually more or less the same thing as we have in the most advanced telescopes. But then studying that, I figured out something. 
our visible light has a lot of energy. It can kick the electrons in this camera to the computer to read it out. And far infrared light does not have enough energy. So the kick it can give is not strong enough. It's not kicking hard enough to go to get these electrons to the computer to make our image. So this technology, oh, this technology doesn't work anymore. Well, the Netherlands is actually famous for its rain. You might have seen it a few last weeks. Um, but one thing you can look through the clouds is very long wavelength rate things. So in the Netherlands, we actually do a lot of radio astronomy. So this is a, a radio telescope, and that technology is actually very similar to the Wi-Fi receivers you have in your home, more or less the same wavelength. But when we want to go to the far infrared, we have another problem. This becomes so small that we cannot use it anymore. So we cannot use this, and we cannot use this. Are we, uh, am I then never going to learn, never ever going to learn what half the universe looks like? So actually, as a graduate student, I started looking around and I found out there's a solution. The kinetic inductance detectors. Now, I want you to really memorize this word, so let's just all repeat this. Kinetic inductance detectors. Now, let's repeat that one more time. Knowledge, get, getting knowledge repetition. Kinetic inductance detectors are awesome. <laughs> yes, can you please repeat that? Kinetic inductance detectors are awesome. One more time. Kids are awesome. <laughs> so what makes, what makes kids so awesome? So I studied for five years on these things. Uh, as I said, they were invented here at, in 2003 at Caltech by this cool professor, Jonas Muzinas, who was until recently also the chief technologist at JPL. And having studied his invention for five years, I was, of course, very honored that me here with my PhD degree, he was in the committee of my wise men whether I was worthy of this. So what did I learn in these five years? Well, why ki kids are so awesome is that this little, this little thing, this little squiggly line, is actually no more than this, an organ pipe. The squiggly line gives a very specific resonance, a very specific tone. This pure tone, which you hear from organ pipe, we can measure a pure tone in our kids from a, in, in a, as an electrical signal. And then when we shine light on this resonator, it actually heats up the resonator a little bit. And this little bit of heat, just like if you would heat up the air in an organ pipe, it heats up uh, the, if you heat up the air in an organ pipe, it changes the tone of the organ pipe. And just like we heat up our resonator a little bit, it changes the tone we hear back from our resonator. Now, so we can measure the light, and we can actually measure the light from this far infrared radiation, but that's not enough. There's very similar technology which was used to create the image I just showed you, this noisy image. But that has two main drawbacks. First of all, every single pixel, so every single image element, in a CCD there's a million or more image elements. In the far infrared, we only have 100, maybe 200. And the reason for that is that every image element comes with its own four wires to read it out. While this thing only has two wires to read it out. Um, now the strength of these things is what can you do with an organ? You can, or with an organ pipe, you can make an organ out of it. You can take thousands of organ pipes with slightly different tones and still make them sound together with a single bellows. Our resonators, we can make them, every single one of them, a slightly different tone, which means we can put them on one readout line. And this one readout line can read out such a chip which contains a thousand different image elements. That's already more than 10 times more than we have now, allowing us to see the infrared sky 10 times faster. Now I have my chip, I've done my homework, but now I need to go to the telescope. So this year I came to Caltech JPL, uh, and actually, as you can see, Caltech, 10 years after its discovery, put the first camera on the Caltech millimeter observatory, and quickly after that, 
new cameras are following. And hopefully this fall it is my turn to take my chip, which is part of the super spec camera, to go to Mexico, to the large millimeter telescope, where I will be able to see the far infrared universe, seeing the unseen, learning what this unseen half of the universe is telling us. Thank you. <laughs>